In this video, I aim to give you a solid introduction to the key considerations and topics that you need to think about as you design or write a large software system. Now, this will be a really good video for kind of intermediate programmers or people that are starting to work on larger projects and are considering what else they need to do other than just straight writing code. As it turns out, as you get into large code bases, you get into large projects, there's a lot of considerations and concerns that pop up, and it's a lot easier to be thinking about them from the beginning than to have to worry about them after you've already written half of the code or you've designed something that maybe is suboptimal. I'm not going to teach you how to design Netflix. I'm not going to teach you how to design Google. We're not going to get into anything technical. It's just going to be these key considerations and concerns and kind of a good way to get your brain in the correct place as you start working on something a bit larger. So with that said, sit back, relax, and let me explain to you some of these key considerations and concerns related to large scale software systems. Now, moving immediately to a small tangent here, when I design a YouTube video, I need to think about the actual content itself, how I want the YouTube video to flow, the different sections or chapters, and also the monetization strategy. Now, in this video, the strategy is a sponsor, which you're about to watch. Before we get started, I need to thank Filestack for sponsoring this video. Filestack lets you simplify your file handling by providing a simple file uploader and powerful APIs to upload, transform, and deliver any file into your app. With Filestack, you can accelerate innovation through reusable components and automate content workflow tasks into a single API call. Filestack can handle borders and effects, document conversions, object detection, explicit content detection, and much, much more. Using Filestack's easy-to-use UI allows you to create reusable workflows that require no coding knowledge and can be modified rapidly. Over 100,000 people are currently using Filestack, and you can join them today for free by clicking the link in the description. Thanks again to Filestack for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into it. So as I was saying, when I design a YouTube video, I kind of break it into sections or chapters to keep it organized. And the sections I'm going to share with you here are the following. The first is actually breaking a system into subsystems, which is kind of what I'm doing right now with this video. The second is testing. The third is deployment. Then I have documentation, scaling and security. Now, before you can even really consider any of these things, I do feel like you need to have a fundamental understanding of programming and of kind of organizing code in general. So this is at a larger level, but you need to actually understand how you break code into modules, into packages, into functions, how you keep your code clean and organized, because if you can't do that, none of this is really going to matter when it comes to writing a large scale system. If you want to learn that, I have a ton of free videos here on YouTube. I also have a course. It's called ProgrammingExpert.io. You can use discount code Tim from the link in the description. But I want to mention that you should have a fundamental understanding here before starting to design any really large scale systems. You should be confident in your programming abilities. So moving in here to point number one, I have breaking a system into subsystems. Now, this is one of the more important points on this list, and this is really going to dictate how much of a pain in the ass it is to develop your project or your application or whatever it is that you're making. It's very important that from the beginning of your software project life cycle that you actually determine what subsystems are going to make up the system as a whole. Now, what I mean by this is rather than having, say, one massive code base that does everything right, you want to break it into individual and kind of logical components which work together to solve a problem. Now, this is very important because if you can break one system into, say, 20, 30, maybe 40 subsystems, now you can be confident that each individual system is working as it should be because it's much easier to test smaller pieces of code right, or smaller systems. So maybe you have an authentication system, you have a messaging system, you have an achievement system, you have all of these different subsystems. They're a lot easier to write because you're only writing one at a time, a lot easier to maintain, a lot easier to debug, to test and to scale up or scale down depending on uh, kind of what is required in your application. Essentially, you're reducing complexity in a code base by splitting your system up into multiple subsystems. And like I said, that provides a lot of different advantages, especially based on the different considerations I'm going to have coming up next. So if we were to consider, say, a mobile game, 
Maybe you have your authentication system. Maybe you do have live messaging between players. That would be its own separate system. Maybe you have the user interface as a whole that you could consider a system that interacts with all of the backend systems that you have. Maybe you have the achievement system. Maybe you have some system related to actually playing the different games. If it's a mobile game or mobile app or something like that, right? You may have a system related to keeping score. Uh, you may have you know, all kinds of different subsystems. It really depends on what you're doing. But what I like to do when I start a project is determine kind of in a vague sense what these systems are that I'm going to have. Now, I may add more, I may remove some or combine them together, but at least I'm considering how I'm going to break this apart to make it much easier for me to manage later on. And if I needed to, I could say outsource the development of one of these systems to someone else. So hopefully that kind of puts your mind in the right place at the beginning of development. How do I break this down? How do I make this nice and simple? And then from there, when you have a subsystem, you would then break that down into individual classes, individual modules, individual packages, and go to the finest level of detail essentially you can to make it as easy as, okay, I need to do this function, this function, this class, and this class. Once I build all of that, I now have this subsystem, then I build all of my subsystems and I have the entire application. So moving on here to topic or consideration number two, I have testing. Now testing is extremely important, especially as you start to write a lot of code and move into a complex code base that has a lot of different systems and a lot of different stuff going on. But it's also very important to consider how you're writing code based on the fact that you're going to have to test that code. So I'll elaborate on that more later on. When I say testing, I'm talking about any type of testing, manual testing, integration testing, unit testing, uh, testing a database, testing backend functions. There's a million different tests that you can write, front end tests, UI component tests. You can test practically anything in your application. So you need to consider right from the beginning, okay, what do I wanna test? How much of a focus or emphasis do I want to have on testing? Is it absolutely necessary that I test every single component or every single function in my application? Uh, and am I going to be, say, mocking different components or mocking different modules in my testing? Do I want to have a live test that actually uses, say, a real database? Do I want to mock the database? These are all things you want to think about and consider. And the thing with testing is that, yes, it is very important, but you also don't want to be slowed down a ton by writing tests. It does take a long time to write automated tests, especially ones that are high quality and actually give you confidence that this test is meaningful. But again, they take a long time. So do you want to do that for the entire application? Is it absolutely necessary? Those are things that you need to consider. Now, moving into kind of the second stage of testing here, it's important to be thinking about this stuff because as you're writing code, you need to write code that is testable. If you want to be testing a certain amount of code or certain features, you have to write it in a very specific way, because if you make it too complicated or too difficult to test in isolation, you're not going to be able to test it or you're going to have to rewrite the code to be able to test it properly. So that's really what this section is about. And I'll just lastly say here that at the beginning of development, it will seem like testing is slowing you down, like it's taking a lot of time and that it's not really meaningful because you can easily manually test everything that you're doing. However, as you get into more and more features, more and more subsystems being integrated into your software, you realize the importance of testing because now, rather than having to manually test everything, you press a single button or you run a single command and all of a sudden you have confidence that you haven't broken something else in your application by writing new code. Um, and in the same light here, if you were to add new people to your code base that maybe weren't as familiar with it as you, they could have confidence that they're not breaking something or messing something up by running automated tests. So moving on here to topic number three, I have deployment. Now, this is concerned with how you're actually going to be serving your application or software. So you've written it in a development environment. Maybe you have it on localhost or you're testing it on an emulator or something along those lines. Now, how are you going to take this code and deploy it so that users can actually access it? Is this going to be on mobile? Is it going to be on web? Are you going to have it automatically de be deployed? Say every hour or every day or every time you make a change to the code base? Are you going to deploy it maybe in set intervals every week? Are you going to be pushing updates to users where they would have to download something to uh, get new features in the application? How are you communicating with your users? Are you going to do that through 
a deployment where you're actually modifying the code base, or maybe you have some backend system that you can kind of play with or mess with that then serves something new to the front end of the application and gives a message to your users. I'm just rattling off kind of random ideas here. There's not a lot of content I have for this specific section, but of course it's important to consider, okay, I've written this stuff in development. How am I going to actually give this to my users? How am I going to test that it's working properly? How am I going to emulate my development environment in a deployment environment? How am I going to scale this? Do I have multiple systems being deployed all at the same time? Maybe I'm only deploying my front end when I make a change and my back end stuff will stay the same. I don't know. I'm just trying to give you examples to think about here because deployment is very important and it's something a lot of people leave until the very last step and then they realize, shit, I need to change the way I'm doing this because it doesn't work with how I'm going to deploy this code. Anyways, that's what I have for that. On to the next one. So now moving on to consideration number four, which is all of your favorites, and this is documentation. Now, clearly that's a joke. Everybody hates documentation. They hate writing it. They hate reading it. They hate using it, whatever. They just don't like documentation and I don't blame them. I am like you guys as well. I really dislike writing documentation. I'd much rather write code, but it is something important that you have to do. Now, a lot of code bases, and I'll say this from personal experience, uh, they'll start off very simple, very easy to understand. Maybe it's just you or two or three people working on this code. And it seems like a waste of time to write documentation, especially when you're just explaining something that you already know or that your teammates already know. But it becomes more and more important as the code base gets larger because you may go a few months without viewing a certain portion of this code base or without viewing a feature that you worked a very long time on and now it's completely finished. Or alternatively, maybe you're working for a startup like I'm doing right now, and then the company grows and you bring on new developers, and now you're tasked with writing documentation for two weeks to help onboard them into the code base. So again, something you want to consider, do I need documentation for this section? Is this something I'm going to remember forever? Probably not. Should I write documentation on how to set the code base up in case maybe non-technical people need to do that? Should I write it on specific features? or systems. You don't have to go overboard here. So what I'm really talking about here is just being cognizant of the fact that this code is likely going to live for a long time. Assuming whatever you're doing is successful, you're probably going to bring new people onto it and you yourself will likely forget some of the stuff that you knew really well as the code base matures and you're working on other features. With that in mind, you probably want to be writing documentation. You don't need to kill yourself and go overboard with it, but maybe dedicate, you know, half an hour a day or a few hours a week to documenting different features and making sure that anyone that comes to this code base will have a decent idea of what is going on and what they need to do to maybe get things set up and to add code, for example, to the code base. So moving on to topic number five, we have scaling. Now, scaling is something that, again, a lot of people don't consider because many projects start off with only a few users or they're only being used for a hobby. And a lot of people never really envision their software being used by hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people or people around the world in different time zones and geographic regions and languages and all of this type of stuff. And it is something that even though you may not necessarily implement immediately, you want to be thinking about when you're writing code because it can save you a lot of time and money down the line. For example, right now, I am writing a lot of code using Firebase. Now, Firebase is notoriously expensive, and the way in which you do database reads and writes and, say, uh, serverless function calls can drastically impact the cost of your hosting and project. For example, if I write an algorithm that's n squared time relative to maybe database reads and writes, but I could have optimized that to be o n time, where it's just linear time, that's saving me drastic amounts of money, right? Especially if I have tens of thousands of users that are all interacting with this algorithm or whatever's reading and writing from the database. So you want to be very cognizant of that because it would suck to get to a point where, okay, now you have a bunch of users, your app's taking off. Oh, but it's costing you $100,000 a month to host it because you didn't consider how expensive it was going to be, for example, to scale your application. Now, that's one scenario. You can also have other scenarios where you just are unable to scale the way you've written code. You can't deploy it on multiple servers. You can't actually scale it up or you're just having a lot of lag and a lot of delay based on how you've done things because you didn't consider the fact you were going to have a million entries in your database. Again, all things you want to think about earlier rather than later. And I'm just trying to put those in your head. All right. So moving on here to topic number six, which admittedly I probably should have put earlier. 
but this is security. Now, this becomes very important, especially when you have a lot of separate systems in your application. You need to find a way to almost synchronize your authorization or authentication between these different systems and ensure that users only have access to what is intended for them to have access to. You need to be very careful with the way that you protect, say, your database, for example, with rate limiting, with uh, the authorization to read or view different documents or tables or rows or whatever it is that you're using. Uh, and you need a way to easily authenticate your users as well. Are you going to be storing passwords on your server? Are you going to use something like OAuth or Google sign in or Facebook sign in? What is your authentication system and how are you going to verify that the users that are signed in are who they say they are? Very important to do. Another thing to consider related to security is stuff like rate limiting, DDoS. Uh, what's going to happen if someone were to, say, mess with your software or your front end and hit an API a million times per second? I know that's an exaggeration, but you get what I mean. Are you going to stop them from doing that? How are you handling those types of scenarios? Fortunately, there's a lot of stuff that's built that does this for you, but you need to just consider the security of your application as you're building it out and imagine that there may be and probably will be bad actors in your system that are trying to break the application, that are trying to hack into someone's profile, that are trying to manipulate, say, their score or their leaderboard ranking or something along those lines. Again, you need to really think about that and consider that when you're building yeah all right so with that said guys i think i'm going to start wrapping it up here if you did stick around until the end of the video thank you very much i'm going to leave you with the image of my cat sleeping on my desk her name is sophie i actually have two cats and if you can remember guess the name of my other cat in the comment section down below if one of you gets it correct then i will pin your comment anyways i hope you guys enjoyed if you did make sure you leave a like subscribe to the channel and i will see you in another one